Hi, Jonathan. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's our pleasure to have you on. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright of Blogging Heads TV, and this is an episode of Worldwise. Uh, and you are Jonathan Kay, and you're a Canadian journalist, and uh, in fact, Canada is the country we're going to become wiser about in this episode of Worldwise. You are uh, on staff at the National Post, right, uh, as a managing editor or something? I'm managing editor for comment at the National Post. For comment. Although in, in recent years, I've probably spent most of my time blogging, which is uh, what most of us at uh, our newspaper are uh, concentrating on these days. Okay. Uh, and you're also a contributor to various things like uh, Commentary, New York Post, and, and many other periodicals. Yeah, and, in, the, in the U.S., yeah, New York Post, I've written for Commentary, uh, you know, Once in a Blue Moon, New Yorker, New York Times, some of the blue chip uh, slate salon, uh, that type of thing. You know, we just had a blue moon, by the way, so you should, I hope, I hope you, you placed an op-ed in the New York Times, because I think two or three nights ago we had a blue moon. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a rare treat for me, but uh, it does happen. Yeah, well, congratulations on that placement. Um, so, and, and are you still a visiting fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, or is that an archaic... Uh... Yeah, no, I'm a... Uh, well, they now call me a fellow. Uh, my visit Ooh. was over. It's, if you Ooh. sleep on the couch long enough, they give you a bed. Uh, yeah, it's easier. And, uh, so, yeah, that's in Washington, D.C., although I, I live here in Toronto. Uh, I mm -hmm. contribute to FDD publications and uh, media stuff, and I go to their conferences, um, which brings me to the States every once in a while, but usually I'm here in Canada. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. So, I think we have to start with the, the sexiest story in Canada. You know, and I think a lot of Americans are the, under the mistaken impression that there are no sexy stories emanating from Canada. But, and we, and we will talk later about stereotypes of Canada and Canadian stereotypes of, of America. But, the Quebec's, as I understand it, Quebec's strategic maple syrup reserve was the target of a successful heist. Yeah, uh, thirty million dollars worth, as I understand, of, of syrup are missing That's from right. the from what is being called the strategic maple syrup reserve. I can't believe that's the actual name, right? Uh, apparently, that's uh, that's that's the name or something close to it. Um, and you know, Americans have asked me, well, you know, when maple syrup prices spike, does that mean the prime minister has pressure on him to release syrup from the maple syrup reserve, sort of like mm. Obama is always being pressured to? release oil from the U.S. Strategic Reserve when gas prices get uh, too high. However, I hate to disappoint people. I actually never heard of this uh, maple syrup reserve until the story broke, but apparently it does exist. And I understand why it does exist, because, you know, Canadian maple syrup is a brand, uh, and like all brands, uh, you want consistency. And if there's a bad year in syrup production, mm -hmm. which does happen, uh, right. and it's not on the shelves, mm -hmm. and people are forced to buy Aunt Jemima, uh, obviously, that is bad for the Canadian brand because people may become addicted to Aunt Jemima, and they may say, hey, you know what, this Aunt Jemima stuff, it's a third the price, and it tastes almost as good, so we're going to stick with it. So when that happens, we actually have to open up with the strategic reserve, and apparently, that, just to make sure people don't get hooked on the artificial stuff. That would be a threat to your national security yeah. if that happened. Yeah. And then, by the and, way, there are people in Canada who actually, including my in-laws, I'll go to their house and they're using Aunt Jemima, and I ooh. find it absolutely disgusting. It's kind of like being in a family in France, and it turns out they're drinking Coors Light with their dinner or something like that. It's, uh, yeah. yeah. I would think you'd have a word with them about that. Yeah, it's it's pretty embarrassing, actually. Um, and, and actually, what this thing is analogous to, more than the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, is actually American uh, farm price supports, right, where the government will take, when, when prices get, uh, our, our, I guess when prices are too low, our government will buy some of the crops from farmers, and when I don't know, it, it, it's it is. Uh, I mean, it, I, I was assuming it was that kind of thing where where the it was a kind of a result of farmers lobbying for some sort of floor on the prices they can expect for for uh, maple syrup, or, or I guess farmers may not be the word for the people who produce maple syrup. But anyway, uh, you're suggesting it actually has more to do with making sure that. Uh, Canadian syrup is not uh, undercut in in markets, including international markets? Yeah, I mean, part of the way it's justified is, well, you, you need a constant supply. Another mm -hmm. way is it's justified is the same way that any agricultural price support mechanism is supported, that you need to support the farming lifestyle. Uh, and the idea is if there's a terrible year, people are just going to go out of business. And, I mean, this sort of logic is used to justify all kinds of things. And, by the way, Canada has agricultural supports for everything, uh, from from cheese to milk in the past, wheat and barley and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. 
Uh, the dairy industry in Canada is especially heavily subsidized, and it's, it's actually one of the things that has kept us out of certain international trade agreements is supply management in the dairy industry. Although, to my knowledge, no one has ever uh, taken issue with supply management in the maple syrup industry. Although it is something that would affect people in, say, Vermont. I've been to Vermont, and they have pretty mm -hmm. good maple syrup down there, uh, mm -hmm. and they are a competitor. Although right now I think Canada is a world leader in maple syrup production. Well, we don't have to get jingoistic about it, you know. Well, yeah, it's, it's all good stuff, and... Uh, you know, people do take it seriously. I, I actually do have a practice of if I am going to, say, uh, you know, IHOP uh, or Denny's down in the States, I will some, this is true, I will actually sometimes bring maple syrup because I hate to have a good breakfast spoiled by uh, some artificial corn syrup type substitute poured all over my you're, 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 you're hitting pretty close to home. I was brought up on Log Cabin, which is people probably know as fake maple syrup. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty disgusting. No, it was actually perfectly good, but it was fake. All right. And, and, and inexpensive, you know. Yeah. But, but I've recovered from the slight that you've just inflicted already. So, um, well, just quickly, they have not found the maple syrup. I mean, $30 million in maple syrup is a lot of maple syrup. It's like, how do you unload that? I mean, you, you can't just go pawn shop by pawn shop, right, selling bottles of maple syrup. If you're a thief... How do you unload $30 million worth of maple syrup? Yeah, it might not be as much maple syrup as you think. Uh, you know, even here in Canada, if you get, say, a 250 milliliter bottle of maple syrup, uh, that's, you know, I don't know what that converts to in your primitive American imperial units, but, you know, it's a small bottle of maple syrup. It can, it can run you something like 10 bucks. Uh, so you could probably fit something like $30 million of maple syrup in one big uh, 14 or 18 wheeler. Uh, really? Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's not that much maple syrup. Uh, and I actually have very little experience fencing maple syrup, so um, I, I really I have no intelligent answer to your question. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I, but they, the culprits have not been caught and brought to justice again. To my knowledge, no. Uh, it's uh, it's something. Uh, by the way, this is actually, it's an interesting story. It's it's one of those uh, few Canadian stories that actually have my American friends emailing me. Uh, you know, we can have an election here, no one cares. We can have a referendum, Americans don't care. But if someone steals a truckload of maple syrup, suddenly people I haven't spoken to in five years are emailing me for, for details about it. Well, it is, I, with all due respect, one of the more interesting things to come out of Canada in a, a millennium or so. <laughs> um, maybe we should quickly just get right to the stereotype issue, as long as we're trading, you know, insults like this. But... Uh, you know, you ha you're probably you probably have a take on a sense for American stereotypes about Canada and Canadians, right? Yeah, yeah. I, th I mean, I think the most intelligent thing anyone's ever said for an American audience about uh, Canada is that we're basically one big Vermont. You know, I don't know how many of your uh, your viewers are, are familiar with attitudes in Vermont, but let's say you were in Montpelier, Vermont, and you walked into one of their many artsy cafes there, and you were to ask the average uh, coffee house uh, habitué in Montpelier, Vermont, what they thought about abortion or the environment uh, or politics or who they were going to vote for, the answer you get, and even the accent they would deliver their answer in, would probably pretty closely approximate the political attitude of most Anglo-Canadians between about Winnipeg and Montreal. Uh, so if the idea of living in one big Vermont appeals to you, then you would like Canada. Uh, that, that, I think, is, is the best way I could summarize political and social attitudes in, in my country. So they would say about instead of about? I don't, I, that particular thing, I, I'm not sure, but, you know, can, Canadians have a pretty neutral accent. I mean, there's, there's one or two quirks we have, that's one of them. Uh, you Although yours is not that bad. Yours is kind of halfway between about and about. Yeah, well, I, I spent a few years in the United States, right? So mm -hmm. I saw, like, I rubbed off my ethnic edges when mm -hmm. I was uh, on the east coast of, uh, of the United States. Right. That, that was successful, a successful visit. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it goes beyond uh, political ideology. I mean, the stereotype about Canadians. There's also, and maybe you'd say this is this is uh, a stereotype about people in Vermont, but there's also a sense of, uh, you know, kind of blandness. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, it's certainly true of our politics. Uh, it, during, for instance, during the recent uh, Republican National Convention, uh, you know, I was on Twitter, and I was following the Twitter feeds of my Canadian journalist friends who were down there watching it, and they couldn't believe how rough and tumble it was. They couldn't believe how harsh the rhetoric was. They couldn't mm -hmm. believe uh, the partisanship, the tribalism. Uh, you know, in Canada, I think politics in general, uh, public life in general, is blander. 
And in fact, when people do run, for instance, negative campaign ads in this country, uh, they are always attacked with the phrase American style. You know, uh, how can you use these American style political methods? How can you mm -hmm. endorse American style health care, uh, American style capitalism? Uh, you know, that is that is considered a term of abuse on, on the left, at least here in Canada. Um, so, I, I mean, I think it's, it's accurate to a certain extent that things, public life here is a little bit blander. Uh, although I think certainly in the last few years, maybe Canadians have come to appreciate that because they think the United States, to a certain extent, has gone off the rails with partisanship, uh, mm -hmm. at least since Obama was elected. Mm -hmm. Well, some people would trace part of this further back, yeah. uh, all, all the way to the years of, say, Newt Gingrich as, as uh, Speaker of the House. But, um, but, 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 so, so you you accept the stereotypes as more or less accurate. Yeah, and by the way, let me. I agree with you about you know the the quality of American life. I think the reason Canadians have become more sensitive to it in the last five or ten years is the rising popularity popularity of American cable television in the United States and Canada, particularly huh. American cable news. You know, uh, f until about five years ago, most Canadians didn't have access to, to say, Fox News uh, or MSNBC. So it's only in the last few years that Canadians have really become attuned to American political life in that intimate, real-time sense uh, through talking head shows on cable TV. And I think that is the window, for better or for worse, we have into American life. And it makes us a little bit maybe more proud of being bland. I see. So they have a particularly unflattering uh, vantage point yeah. from, from which to view uh, Americans. And, but but has, has the tone proved at all contagious? A little bit. I mean, we do have a sort of copycat uh, network in, in Canada called Sun News, which has modeled itself after Fox News. It came online about a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you do see some elements in the Canadian media uh, and, you know, I think attack ads are becoming more popular uh, in the Canadian uh, media. Uh, you know, there is some, um, some bleeding into Canadian political life from the United States. But mm -hmm. by temperament, I think <clears throat> you're right, we're just blander and we, we bristle more at mm -hmm. negativity in our public life. It's just something mm -hmm. that is part of the Canadian political DNA. And so, so is Sun like Fox not just in the tone but in its ideology? It's yes. conservative? Yes. Okay. And you're at a... Uh, at a conservative, the, Na the National Post is thought of as a conservative periodical, right? I say, the National Post, I'd say, is roughly analogous to the Wall Street Journal in the sense that it has conservative opinion pages. Uh, the news reporting is uh, probably hues a little closer to the center, and it also has a large business constituency, much like the Wall Street Journal. We have an insert called the Financial Post, which together with the Globe and Mail's report on business are the two most popular uh, business newspaper sections in Canada. Okay. And does conservative mean in Canada much like what it means in America? Uh, I would say small c conservative does. You know, it means free markets, laissez-faire, very little regulation. Uh, it has a connotation of hawkishness in foreign affairs, support for the Iraq war, uh, that sort of thing. Um, however, the Canadian capital C conservative party, which is the party of Stephen Harper, it's the party that uh, rules Canada now, uh, I would argue that it is more of a European-style uh, conservatism. Uh, it, it has preserved the Canadian welfare state. Um, our leaders don't go around you know, giving out copies of the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged to their constituents. Uh, even though it's called the Conservative Party, it has maintained Canada's uh, single-payer public health care system. You know, mm -hmm. We're the only, the only OECD country in the world that doesn't permit private insurance for core medical needs. Um, you know, we're, we're, we have a pretty socialist uh, health system. We have a pretty generous um, welfare state. And those are things that have not changed, despite the fact that the current capital C conservative party has been in power uh, mm -hmm. since 2006. So uh, then, then one function of a conservative party being in power, and, and, and they have been in power for a while now in Canada, um, it is to keep the welfare state from getting even more welfare-y, I guess. Yeah. It, it's, it's, a holding, it's a holding action to some extent. Yeah, there's that. Uh, I mean, it's, it's sort of, I would say, more of a European definition of conservatism. I mean, in Europe, conservative tends to mean just don't rock the boat. Right, don't Keep things they yeah. are. Uh, in, in the United States, the meaning of conservative, it, it's actually the opposite. Uh, conservatism has become a revolutionary ideology mm -hmm. uh, in favor of turning back the clock many generations. But in Canada, I'd say it retains something of its European meaning. 
uh, which is one of the reasons, you know, going back to your previous statement that Canadians tend to be blander, uh, we tend to uh, reward constancy uh, in policy. Uh, and here, you know, I'm broadcasting from Ontario where Dalton McGuinty is Premier and he basically has become elected several times basically by changing nothing. Um, you know, mm -hmm. leader, leaders, the successful leaders in Canada, uh, at least in my generation, um, have really changed very little. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's how they stay in power. Okay. And you said that uh, small C, I think uh, uh, you said small C conservatism was, was like American conservatism, current American conservatism, in being hawkish on foreign policy, yeah. whereas the party might or might not be? Yeah, I mean, the party has disappointed its small C conservative base, which is to say it's disappointed its, its ideological base. I mean, there is a small constituency in Canada uh, which supports uh, very free markets. It supports um, completely dismantling the current uh, public health care system. Um, uh, and a lot of the activists from that uh, ideological wing were the brain trust behind the victory of the con con current large seat conservative party mm -hmm. and they spent the last five or six years grumbling about how Stephen Harper hasn't implemented any or I shouldn't say any that's that's not quite true but uh, but basically he's retained the Canadian welfare state and so I think small seat conservatives in Canada are, are quite frustrated mm -hmm. uh, these are the sort of tea party types uh, they don't feel like they have any mainstream party that is uh, militating on their behalf but on foreign policy he has been yes. fairly supportive of American adventures abroad, hasn't he? I mean, in Afghanistan and things like that? This has been a huge shift in Canadian public life uh, in the last 10 years. And it didn't even start with Harper. It started with Paul Martin, uh, who was the Liberal Prime Minister who preceded him. Paul Martin was the Prime Minister who decided that not only were the Canadians going to go into Afghanistan, but they were going to take a major combat role. They were going to take the command of the Kandahar district, which as you know, as, uh, is the part of Afghanistan in the south, which has seen some of the most ferocious fighting. Mm -hmm. And Canadians, uh, although they sent a relatively small contingent there, it was only about 2,000 troops, which is very small by American standards. Uh, they took a lot of casualties. Um, they've, they fought hard. And they really changed the image of, of the military in Canada. I mean, in, in, until about 10 years ago, um, Canada was really a very pacifistic country. That started with, uh, with Trudeau, uh, who departed a lot from our World War II heritage. Um, and in the last 10 years, I think Canadians have become a lot more proud of their military, um, and we've become a lot more hawkish. Uh, the Iraq War is still very unpopular in Canada, but aside from the Iraq War, uh, you know, Canadians took part in, in the Libyan campaign uh, last year, and Canada has been an extraordinarily good friend to Israel in the last decade. Uh, our voting record, the United Nations in support of Israel, is second to none. Uh, and again, that's something that changed over the last decade. So you're quite right. In foreign affairs, Canada has become a much more, I don't want to say conservative country, it's become a much more hawkish country. Uh, and its foreign policy uh, aligns um, uh, very much with the United States uh, towards Iran, toward the Middle East in general, uh, certainly toward Israel. And, and how do you account for the change? I th a lot of it has to do with our deployment in Afghanistan. Uh, our deployment in Afghanistan was the first real big combat deployment Canada has had outside of peacekeeping operations since the Korean War. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it had a pronounced effect. Uh, the video footage of it uh, on Canadian television screens, um, American politicians thanking Canada for their effort in Afghanistan. I mean, I think these awakened a lot of, uh, shall we say, warrior instincts that have been dormant since the 1950s for many Canadians. You know, Pierre, Pierre Trudeau convinced us we were a nation of pacifists and that our role in the world was to sort of solve the world's squabbles at the negotiating table. Mm -hmm. um, and Canadians took great pride in, in being a multilateral nation and um, you know, an, an honest broker is the phrase that was often used, the idea that everybody trusted us, and that it was somehow beneath our dignity to actually, uh, you know, mm -hmm. take up a military cause. But that changed a lot uh, since 9-11. 9-11 changed Canada quite a bit. And the, uh, the Afghanistan experience has not soured Canadians, uh, I gather. I mean, I think it might, because the war is, is far from being an obvious success. In fact, it's, it's totally unclear, like, increasingly what good is is you know, kind of being done there and where things are headed and the, the casualties though the canadian casualties though low in absolute terms are you know relative to the size of the size of the canadian population they're not nothing and, and I, so i would imagine some canadians saying wait a second what are these guys dying for but you're saying that's not happening uh i definitely think that i mean 
Canadians aren't, I mean, they follow the news. They know that the Afghanistan campaign has been a slog. Uh, they know that it has been, by no means, you can chalk Afghanistan up in the victory column. But I think Canadians are proud that we did our duty in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, they feel that, you know, we've sat out a number of conflicts uh, in the international arena and that this was something that it was win or lose, it was a morally justified war because of something that happened on 9-11. Uh, mm -hmm. And that it wasn't a morally tainted campaign like Iraq, and so I think there was there has been pride in this country that win or lose we've at least done our duty, we stood by the United States, we sent our troops there. I also think there's pride that in some cases Canada has really done a good nation building job in the Kabul area and in the Kandahar area, mm -hmm. uh, and tales of Canadians helping build villages and build schools and all that stuff they carry a lot of weight here in Canada. Um, so not just the combat side but the nation building side, and. Also, I think the conservative government of Stephen Harper was smart. I, I, I think it was a year ago, maybe two years ago, they set an expiry limit on the war, and they said, we're going to be out of this campaign. I think 2012 was, was the year they said, that's going to be the end of combat operations. We're going to keep some trainers in the country. But uh, they, by doing that, they sort of ended the debate before it had a chance to fester. Uh, and so, mm -hmm. you know, we've been in there a decade, and I think most Canadians are proud of what we've done in the decade. Okay. Um, so, uh, we talked a little about American stereotypes of Canadians. I wanted to talk about Canadian stereotypes of Americans. And, and you, you wrote a piece, I guess a couple of years ago now, about anti-Americanism in Canada, which you said had been the defining intellectual ailment for generations. And you, um, and you, you related it to what we've just been talking about. I mean, you, uh, the, the uh, you, you write, in 2003, Canada rejected American in, entreaties to join in the invasion of Iraq, and the Canadian press bristled with shrill attacks on the neocon agenda. Um, so are, are you saying now that that, that, that variant of, of anti-Americanism, as you describe it, has, has kind of subsided? I think it has to a certain extent, because a lot of it was based on Canadian insecurity. Uh, I think, to a large extent, Canadians define themselves... Uh, negatively, by the idea that we're not Americans. Mm -hmm. We don't have a laissez-faire uh, capitalist system. We don't have uh, a private health care system. Um, you know, we, um, we don't go around the world uh, trying to act as the world's policeman. Um, and a lot of that just came from insecurity. I mean, Canada has a weak national identity compared to many other nations. We don't have an ethnic national identity like a lot of European countries. And we also don't have an identity as a superpower like the United States does. So, you know, we have a very weak identity. And to prop up our identity, uh, we used anti-Americanism. And that was a really popular ploy used by the liberal government of Jean Chrétien and, and, and to a certain extent, Paul Martin. Although, as I mentioned, he, he changed things a little bit with his Kandahar deployment. Um, but I think in the last few years, Canada has become a lot less insecure as a country because our economy has done so much better than the United States. And because we've become more secure in our identity uh, and because we don't envy the United States as much as we used to, at least since the 2008 financial crisis, we have less of a need to use anti-Americanism as a crutch uh, to prop up our national self-esteem. And I think that's a very healthy thing. Um, because if you, especially if you looked at the, the left-wing media in Canada around the time I began my journalism in the late 90s, I mean, it was really toxic. Uh, newspapers like the Toronto Star and the Globe and Mail featured articles about Americans that if those articles had been written about any other nation on earth, they'd be considered hate speech. But somehow... Like, like this, what, what kinds of things? Well, there was a Toronto Star columnist who compared George W. Bush to Hitler. Uh, and this was in the Toronto Star, which is the largest mass circulation uh, daily in Canada. So this is the equivalent of someone, you know, in the New York Times or the Washington Post or the L.A. Times writing an op-ed page column uh, comparing George Bush to Hitler. Uh, and it was an ab I mean, I considered it absolutely appalling. I mean, at the time, we actually wrote an editorial in the National Post pointing out how appalling it was. But for some reason, people didn't find it shocking because for a whole generation since the uh, time of Pierre Trudeau, it was somehow considered uh, acceptable, an acceptable slur to attack the Americans on the theory that, well, you know, it's, they're the big 800-pound gorilla on our continent, so they can take it. Uh, and besides, they've done all sorts of evil stuff. Um, so it was, it was considered, you know, open season. Uh, mm -hmm. Anything you want to say about the United States was fine. And that has changed. Uh, a lot of the left-wing columnists who wrote uh, stuff like that have since retired. 
uh, sort of blind America bashing has, has, is now out of fashion. And again, part of that is the fact that in Afghanistan, we fought shoulder, shoulder by shoulder with American troops. Uh, and so it seemed distasteful for us to be attacking the United States when our troops were dying on the same battlefield in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So, but notwithstanding that change, I've got to think that if I go to Canada, well, actually, I was just in Canada last <laughs> week, uh, but, uh, but, you know, it, that, that Canadians, a typical Canadian who knows nothing about me but that I'm American, would, would enter the encounter with me with some preconceptions, right? With some, I, I assume stereotypes persist. They do persist, although I think to a certain extent they've become a little bit more refined since the penetration of American cable news media into Canada. Mm. Uh, I think Canadians uh, are now uh, well aware that the United States itself has a divided identity between blue states and red states. And I think if you told someone here in Canada, yeah, I just got off the plane, uh, you know, I live in Park Slope in Brooklyn, and, um, you know, I'm here with my same-sex partner, or, you know, I'm here with, uh, you know, my interracial wife or whatever, and it, you made it clear that you were a member of the blue state intelligentsia and that you were a liberal, they would treat you just mm -hmm. like a Canadian. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you were coming from, you know, Tennessee or Texas and you had an accent uh, and you started talking about how much you like, love your guns and your pickup trucks and all that stuff, they would immediately fall into the negative stereotypes they associate with red state America. So the stereotype of Americans by Canadians had been essentially, uh, 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 had been based on the conception of Americans as kind of red state Americans. Yeah, and so it used to be monolithic, and it didn't matter where you're coming, you're just a, a, you know, a mm -hmm. bad American. Now it has shrunk to the 50% of the country uh, that is in red state America. And, I mean, mm -hmm. and don't forget, a lot of Canadians have a lot of exposure to American culture through, for instance, visiting Florida mm -hmm. uh, or visiting New York or, you know, if they're from Vancouver, they might spend a lot of time in Seattle. Um, so, you know, they know the border states quite well. They know the blue states quite well. It's the red states that remain sort of a, a mystery to them. Uh, and, and generally it's a mystery that is explained to them through the lens of politics uh, through the lens of columnists they, they read about online or through CNN and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. but, well, yeah, by the way, the, uh, if, should America ever break up along red-blue lines, I, I do think that uh, the blue states would form a more or less continuous... Um, I mean, I think we could just, in theory, merge with Canada without fiddling with the, with the geography too much, couldn't we? I mean, oh, absolutely. You, yeah. You've got you've got the eastern seaboard, the western seaboard in America. I mean, and then kind of the north. I'm not sure. Is there a single reliably red state that adjoins uh, Canada at the border? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, you've got uh, Montana. Uh, oh, Montana. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> what would we do about that? Well. That, that's why it's important that you join the Union, that, that Canada join the blue states in forming a new nation. It would, I mean, in some ways, culturally, it would be a good fit. Uh, you know, if you look at, you know, uh, Seattle, Portland, and Vancouver, uh, mm -hmm. you know, th there's very little to distinguish those three cities, one from the next, uh, in terms of political attitudes and culturally. Uh, Toronto has become the second theater city in North America, and you know, half the people in our theaters here in Toronto are theater goers from the United States uh, during the summer. Uh, Montreal, Quebec City, uh, Toronto are full of tourists. Uh, mm -hmm. Toronto, I mean, there's been talk in recent years of Toronto getting an, an NFL franchise, uh, which would make us even more American. I mean, the only sticking point here, what makes Canada distinct, of course, is the fact of Quebec, which is uh, right. uh, our, our French province. And uh, most Americans, to the extent they know French at all, learned it in high school. Um, and, you know, that, that is the one part of the Canadian identity which is, is, is I think, mysterious to, uh, to many Americans. Yeah, we have some unflattering stereotypes about the French here. Um, so that would be a problem. I, I mean, it would also be a, I mean, this would be a problem for you, right? A Canadian blue state merger, because you would identify more with the red states ideologically, right? Uh, I would Except on social issues, yeah. maybe. No, I, well, I don't think I would. Um, you wouldn't, okay. You know, a Canadian, someone who's conservative by Canadian standards uh, is probably someone who's pretty centrist by American standards. Okay. You know, I, I would probably, my own politics, I would probably line up toward maybe, you know, what used to be called the conservative wing of the Democratic Party. I mean, a mm -hmm. lot of, you know, these wings have sort of dissolved because, uh, you know, the parties have just been forced to become a little bit more monolithic uh, in their their public policies, but um, 
you know, when, when a Canadian tell you should always be suspicious when a Canadian tells you they're conservative because it doesn't really translate into the American idiom. Okay. Yeah. Now, how about this Quebec separatist thing? Uh, that it, it, that looked like it really might happen in the mid '90s, uh, but it seemed, from for, at least from an American vantage point, it has seemed more or less quiescent uh, since then. I, I, is there any any sense of revival of the separatist sentiment in Quebec? Uh, yes and no. Uh, arithmetically, no. Uh, I think something like 35 percent of Quebecers. Uh, say they would like to create a separate country, an, an independent sovereign country called Quebec. Mm -hmm. Now that number, I think, has been fairly stable for years and years. That you know, about a third of Quebecers want to separate. The other two thirds don't necessarily love being in Canada that much, but they don't have especially negative feelings towards Canada, and they recognize that being in Canada carries benefits. Um, David Frum wrote a very interesting column over the weekend. He said mm -hmm. that. Quebec separatists used to be able to point to the European Union, and they'd say, hey, what does it matter if we separate? We'll just be like the EU. And, you know, the EU is working out really well, right? You know, we'll, we'll be like Belgium, and you'll be like Netherlands, and uh, we'll have... And, and, we'll, and we'll hold on to the Canadian currency. Right. Yeah. And as in parallel with the European Union. Yeah, and the EU has shown us what a disaster it can be if you have a currency union without having a fiscal union, which is exactly what Quebec separatists want. Mm -hmm. um, so... I think uh, that's sort of taken a, a little bit of the energy out of their campaign. However, that said, the fact, despite the fact there's only 35% of Quebecers who want to separate, uh, in the Quebec provincial election, which is taking place as we speak in Quebec now, 35% is pretty much all the Parti Québécois, which is the separatist party, is going to need to form a government, perhaps even a majority government within the parliamentary system, hmm. um, because the federalist vote is split between two other parties. Uh, the CAQ and the Liberals, and I, I'm not going to bore your, your viewers, but just saying, you know, the, arith the arithmetic of it is pretty simple. If you've got all the separatists or most of them voting for one party, uh, but you've got the Federalist vote, the non-separatist vote voting for two parties, uh, you, you know, in, under our first past the post parliamentary system, uh, the Parti Québécois may form a majority government, despite the fact that they're a separatist party and only about 35% of Quebecers support separatism. But that wouldn't spell actual separatism, no. would it? If they if no. they took over what, the what, they, what it would spell is an ongoing and extremely irritating campaign that the separatists in the PQ, the Parti Québécois, would then use to leverage their control of the Quebec government into gestures aimed at stirring up separatist support in Quebec. So they'd pick fights with Ottawa. They say demand things like, well, you know, we want an expanded presence at UNESCO. You know, little symbolic fights over cultural issues, international representation, control of budgets, uh, fiscal transfers, that sort of thing, and trying to exacerbate every single disagreement with Ottawa into um, a, uh, a teapot tempest that allows them to claim that Quebecers are being stifled within Canada and uh, that Quebec needs its own sovereign independent status. But, so they would they would extract benefits, including financial benefits, by by wielding the threat of, of stirring up more separatists. This has been their I mean this has been their strategy for years. I don't think the strategy is going to work, is going to work now because I think Anglo Canada uh, outside of Quebec is, is sick of this trick. You mm -hmm. know, uh, Canada has something called equalization, which is a program by which the rich provinces send money to the poor provinces. You know, imagine if every year. Uh, you know, Massachusetts had to send billions and billions of dollars to Mississippi. Uh, you know, this is the equivalent we have. This is part of the Canadian constitutional scheme. And every year, billions of dollars go from Saskatchewan and Alberta uh, to Quebec and poor provinces uh, in Atlantic Canada. And Quebecers know about this, um, even though their government tries to convince them that it's not happening. And as a result of it, there's a lot of Anglo taxpayers in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, Manitoba, who are tired of it and perhaps would be happy if Quebec separated. Mm -hmm. you know, I think, to a certain extent, there are communities within the rest of Canada who are more separatist than Quebec itself because they're getting sick of um, Quebec demands for more money uh, and the ingratitude of many Quebecers for the money they do get on an ongoing basis every year. Okay. Now, has, has technology affected the strength of separatist sentiment at all? By that, what I mean is, you know, uh, it's with beginning with narrow casting, you know, with cable channels as opposed to broadcast channels, and culminating in the internet itself. It's become easier for members of one linguistic group, uh, you know, to surround themselves with media 
that are in that in their language and, and 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 you know just the way it's possible now to cocoon yourself in various ways ideological ethnic whatever but but I, almost kind of surprisingly to me the separatist sentiment doesn't seem to have strengthened a lot in the course of this technological evolution right yeah I, that's because it cuts both ways on one hand they're able to narrow cast on the other hand they uh, are preaching separatism to young voters who increasingly themselves are in a polylinguistic uh, environment. They're sending each other YouTube videos and Twitter mm -hmm. links and Facebook links and all kinds of things uh, in English. And it's diluting the Francophone experience that their separatist leaders uh, want them to have. So, you know, by the time someone is 12 or 13 years old, they're already in a bilingual internet environment. Uh, exchanging email with people all over the world, and it's exactly the opposite of mm -hmm. what a parochial nationalist separatist leader wants, because um, you know he wants a fishbowl, he wants a linguistic fishbowl where everyone's speaking French. Mm -hmm. uh, and quite, we don't have to get into this, but Quebec has all kinds of arcane rules for making sure people live in that linguistic fishbowl. But that's impossible on the internet. You cannot regulate people's linguistic experiences on the internet. And so by the time people are teenagers, they're already bilingual. And they're already aware that their future careers are going to be bilingual and are, are going to be, take place in a global economy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these people have no interest in being in a narrow parochial uh, Quebec country defined on the basis of language. Okay. Um, so uh, tell me, just kind of quickly, I guess, uh, what, uh, how does the American election look from Canada? Are people paying a lot of attention to it? Uh, people are paying attention to it in the same superficial way that I think a lot of Americans are paying attention to it. Uh, you know, I'm getting a lot of empty chair videos uh, from my Canadian friends. Uh, you know, when Clint Eastwood does something dumb, that makes news here. It's on front pages just like it is in the United States. In terms of the actual substance of the campaign, particularly on the Republican side, I think a lot of attitudes in Canada are, you know, quite dismissive. Uh, you know, these folks are nuts. Um, uh, Wait, which folks are nuts? Just I think Americans in general. Yeah, I think. I mean, but little little snippets of it. The you know the sensationalist snippets of it. I think, for instance, uh, the thing that that uh, Senator or would be Senator Aiken said down in Missouri uh, about uh, how a woman's body could shut down. Uh, oh, the, the legitimate uh, yeah. legitimate yeah. rape thing. Yeah, I mean that made huge news here in Canada. Um, mm. The thing, as I said, the thing about Clint Eastwood made made huge news here in Canada. Um, I what about Paul Ryan misremembering his marathon time? Has that made it up, up to the Great North? Uh, that, <laughs> that, you know, yeah, that, that sort of thing made it. Uh, you know, when you had the, uh, the governor of the state of Texas deliver his oops line on television, you know, all those things, again, because of the Internet and because of the intermingling of celebrity and political hmm. culture, that makes news here every bit as much as it does in the United States. Hmm. So the viral moments do cross borders. They, yeah, they cross border completely because you know we're all part of the same Facebook networks, we're all part of the same Twitter networks, uh, and increasingly educated Canadians, the people they went to college with, the people they went to graduate school with, you know, they get their news from Facebook and Twitter clusters uh, that are populated by people on both sides of the border. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there a, is there a clear favorite uh, between Obama and Romney in Canada? Uh, I think there's a lot of affection for Obama. Um, but on the other hand, you know, Romney does have a Canadian connection. You know, when he was, was growing up in Michigan, he used to vacation a lot in, mm -hmm. uh, in Ontario. Oh, yeah, he would strap yeah. his dog on the car and head no, up No, that's there, different. Right? No, that's different. That's when he was in Massachusetts and he drove to Montreal. Uh, well. and, and that's another viral thing that has become huge news uh, in Canada. You know, one of my columnists, Conrad Black, uh, seems to slip a mention of, of it. <laughs> into every column Conrad he writes Black. Now, is he, so he's no longer in prison? Oh, was no, no. Although he was actually writing for me as a columnist when he was in prison. When he was in prison? Yeah. Well, congratulations he on that. Only now, what, does he, wait, does he own, like, he's like a publishing magnate. He doesn't own the National Post, does he? He founded the National Post, and then he sold it. Uh, okay. At the time he went to prison, he was no longer the owner. But he's uh, still a very popular columnist and public figure here in Canada, uh, including probably the most popular columnist at my newspaper. Uh, and he lives in Toronto now, so he doesn't have to send me his columns through the prison email system. But he was allowed to do that, huh? Yeah, uh, and actually I had to sign documents with the U.S. State Department uh, indicating that he wasn't a financial beneficiary uh, of the arrangement. Uh, but, uh, you know, to the credit of the well, U.S. government, was, they allowed him. What was he doing time for? 
Uh, he was uh, convicted uh, under U.S. law mm -hmm. uh, of mail fraud, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was also alleged that he had suppressed evidence in regard to his. I mean, his case was very complex. The under it, it was basically mm -hmm. about him taking uh, payments for his own benefit. Uh, there were no compete payments uh, during the sale of an asset. The underlying aspects were very complicated, but basically the allegation was that he suppressed evidence in the case and that he engaged in mail fraud during the course of the alleged impropriety. He served mm -hmm. uh, about two and a half years, and now he's a free man in Canada. And do you think he's connected to this maple syrup heist? You know, I don't have evidence that he's not, 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 not connected to it, so mm -hmm. I'll just leave it at that. Do you think it's a coincidence that he was let out of prison before the maple syrup heist happened? You know, I have, I have no comment on this. I, I, actually, at this point, I should retain my own counsel because I, I don't want to be an accessory. Well, to speaking of uh, conspiracy yeah. theories, uh, in closing, we should let you mention your book, Among the Truthers, um, A Journey Through America's Growing Conspiracist Underground. Yes. Is it growing? Now, these are, so truthers, you know, you're talking about people who have theories about 9-11 largely, I guess, huh? Yeah, I mean, the, the book was inspired by all these 9-11 uh, uh, conspiracy theorists who were emailing me, uh, and I wrote the book. And the 9-11 the, the truthers, uh, as they call themselves, are still the central case study in the book. But as I began researching the book, I said, you know, these guys believe all sorts of things. And I, I have a chapter on the birthers, and I have a chapter on, on medical conspiracy theorists, and mm -hmm. I have a chapter on anti-Semitic conspiracy theorists. And, uh, but, it, yes, it is uh, part, a big part of American political life, and... Part of the reason I wrote the book was kind of as a, a cautionary tale to fellow Canadians saying, look, we don't want our politics to swing in the direction where, you know, Donald Trump, whose main campaign platform when he was leading the GOP field a year ago was to uh, have an investigation into Barack Obama's birth certificate. You know, that, that, was, that was his main platform plan. And people mm -hmm. forget he was actually the leading GOP contender for a brief moment. Uh, last year. We don't want to get to a point in Canadian politics where we have demagogues like that peddling conspiracy theories also attaining an influential role in Canadian public life. And that's one of the reasons that inspired me uh, to write the book, uh, is, is sort of the freaked out nature of American political discourse in some quarters. Okay, but how would Canada uh, keep itself from following in our footsteps in that regard? I mean, are you saying that, for example, a, a really rancorous uh, political discourse contributes to that kind of thing, or what? Well, part of it is just is, is partisanship. I mean, when you have extreme partisanship, uh, people on both sides want to believe the absolute worst about mm -hmm. the other side. I mean, you have people like Ann Coulter writing, you know, things about liberals, and liberals writing things about conservatives, um, you know, that are just, that are demonic. They're, they're just trying to create cartoon demons out of the other side. And in that kind of environment, people do believe conspiracy theories because they believe the, the other side is, is, is completely evil. Uh, and I'm, I think it's important to try and convince people to step back from that kind of politics. Uh, and in Canada, I think we have stepped back a little bit from that kind of politics. Uh, the other factor is, is, is trust in authority figures. Uh, when trust breaks down in authority figures, that's when conspiracy theories often bloom. Uh, and in the United States, trust in, in Congress, trust in the president, trust even in organized religion, which has come to be seen as politicized, all of those have been eroding for decades. I think in Canada, trust in public theories is a little bit higher, uh, which is why the temperature of a political discourse is a little bit cooler. Hmm. That's one of the reasons we're blander, too. I mean, as you noted, it's, it's also one of the reasons we're blander, and it's one of the reasons that we have this reputation for following the rules. When you have greater trust in your authority figures, you do tend to follow the rules. Uh, so then there is some truth to that aspect of the stereotype of Canadians. So th that's interesting. I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that Canadians have more trust in authority figures historically than Americans, but well, you're saying the, the they do, tradition. and that that's even part of the, related to the alleged blandness. Well, part of it is the monarchist tradition. Uh, you know, the United States was, was born in revolution. Canada was not born in revolution, and to this day, the monarchy is held in extremely high esteem in Canada. You know, whenever you have a public figure who visits Canada, uh, uh, you know, a member of the royal family, uh, it's it's a major news event in Canada, um, and it's it's you know they're often on the front page, and they don't they don't make news here in Canada typically for the for the same reason Prince Harry made news in, in Las Vegas. Um, you know, typically there's all kinds of old-fashioned public appearances and. Um, 
And I think this has a powerful, if subconscious, effect on Canadians' attitudes towards authority figures more generally, because there is so much reverence for the Queen. Mm. Uh, I think a lot of that reverence rubs off on political figures, including the Prime Minister. Yeah, America does have more historical ambivalence toward uh, monarchies, I have to say, or, going yeah. way back. Or power um, in general. And, yeah. and you would trace it back that far. You, you're, you're, you're a believer in kind of historically shaped national character. Uh, well, I think the United States uh, has uh, a very suspicious attitude toward, um, uh, towards power in general. In fact, one mm -hmm. of the things that I found when I was researching my book, Among the Truthers, uh, was that, you know, People on the left think that the right-wingers are conspiracy theorists. People on the right think the left-wing left-wingers are conspiracy theorists. But in the United States, both sides of the political spectrum tend to embrace conspiracy theories. Um, and you saw this with 9-11 conspiracy, cons conspiracy theories, where both sides were convinced that 9-11 was some kind of plot to take over the world. You well, know, I would say the extreme fringes of both sides. I don't think I've ever met anyone who actually believes that. As far yeah, as no, I, know, I, I should emphasize the fringes. But like, if you look at you know the Alex Jones type on the right, they think it was a left wing plot to take over the world for the United Nations, and on the left you had uh, the conspiracy theorists who thought that it was a plot to take over the world on behalf of Halliburton and Dick Cheney. But the conspiracy theories were actually very similar in their structure. It was just a question of who do you think is going to take over the world? Mm -hmm. The unifying factor there is suspicion of power, suspicion that someone is trying to take away basic freedoms that ordinary patriotic yeoman Americans have. Mm -hmm. And I think Americans are always on guard for the idea that someone is trying to take away their freedoms. On the left, it's a suspicion that big corporations are trying to enslave them. On the right, it's the idea that big government is trying to enslave them, take away their guns, take away their states' rights. Um, uh, but the basic structure of the fear is the same. It's a fear of power. It's a fear of t uh, tyranny. And I think a lot of it goes back to the American Revolution. Okay. So your message to Canadians is do not follow in America's footsteps because that way madness lies. I think there's so many wonderful things to copy from the United States. I love their patriotism. You know, I love their the idea that they can go to places like Iraq and Afghanistan and, and, and fix the place and come back and... Wait you know, a it, second. I'm not sure we fixed Iraq or Afghanistan. But you wanted to. The point is you but wanted to. And, yeah, and, and, you, and you like yeah. the fact that we believe we can do it? Or, I like, or you I love like the fact that the, we can do it? I love the belief in the universalism of American values and the yeah. lack of relativism in American discourse. I mean, it's a very noble idea that all of the world could be turned into as free a place as the United States is. And mm -hmm. I think the intentions are very noble. I think sometimes the results can be disastrous. Um, and I think Canadians can learn a lot from that kind of idealism. Uh, but it's since 2008, especially since the financial crisis um, and, and the knock-on effects on American politics, uh, I think there's also a lot of cautionary tales to come out of the United States, and in particular, the, the radicalism and tribalism, which can affect domestic politics if you let it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we can leave it there. With the exception of a question that just occurred to me, I have to ask you, how do you like that Canadian health care system? You know, it's very interesting you say that, because um, my mother-in-law, who uh, I, you know, I, I libeled her by saying she, she prefers Aunt Jemima maple syrup uh, to the real thing, she just had a very interesting experience. She uh, needed a knee replacement because her knee was hurting her real bad. And she had a choice. She could wait six months in the Canadian health system and get her knee for free. Or she could go to Florida and get it done in a week, mm -hmm. but pay $90,000. And I think that pretty much sums it up. Stay here and get things for free, but wait a little bit longer. Or go to the United States and pay a lot of money. And if you're poor, maybe you, don't, you can't even get it because you don't have the money. But you right. get first-class treatment and you get it exactly where you want it. I think that experience she has had has sums up the difference between the two healthcare systems. So there is an escape hatch for affluent people. They say Canada has a single tier health system, but it's mm -hmm. not true. It's a two tier health system, uh, one tier for everybody else and, and one tier for the people who have enough money to go to the clinics in Florida and Boston and Buffalo and Seattle. Mm, okay. All right. Well, thank you for all of this uh, information about life in Canada and, and Canada's perspective, Jonathan. I applaud your interest in Canada. I think all Americans should. Uh, I have a long-standing interest in in, yes. uh, in in Canada, and and it has been sharpened 
by this, although I'm a little alarmed to hear that in some senses Canada is becoming more like America, and I join you in your campaign to halt that before it gets out of hand. All right, well, thank you. I'm glad we could, we could sh we share that aspiration. Yeah, we, we're, we're on the same team now. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you for having me. Okay, bye-bye.